Well, good evening to everyone. So good to see you here. And at my age, I'm said it's glad to be seen. So, you know, that's because uh, we don't want to be seen because the rapture's right at hand, right? I mean, just, just listen to the sounds of the world, and it's pretty evident, I think. I, I don't know, I'm hoping, <laughs> as I hope we all are. <laughs> Good to have you as always, and uh, we have a very new time, uh, come newcomer rather, to our speaking uh, engagement sequence because he hasn't spoken here before. I think you're going to find it very interesting. Let me, uh, before we do the introductions for Dr. Harper, I'd like Ed Jolman to come up and say a couple of words about the forthcoming expedition. How many of you knew we're going to the Cosmosphere in Hutchison, Kansas over Labor Day? All right. How many of you are going to go on that trip? Okay, those who are going to go on the trip, I need to visit with you in the lobby immediately, like right now, and then you can come back in and catch Dr. Harper's presentation. Uh, so nobody else is interested in going to the most awesome space museum in the entire world. Only crazy people don't go to this place. Who here is crazy? Just raise your hand. Wow, Doc, this place is set for you. You know, he's a psychiatrist, you know. All right, this is going to be a more interesting session than I thought. Okay, that's all I've got then. If uh, those going to the Cosmosphere can step out to the lobby with Janie and I for a few minutes, then you'll be right back in here. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Jim, would you come up and just say a couple of words about the forthcoming presentation next month? And um, um, Next month we're going to show a video that's generated a lot of... Uh, a lot of interest, a lot of questions, a lot of skepticism. Uh, the, the topic is biblical astronomy, and uh, the video is the four blood moons. And when you start digging into the scriptures and what it says about the heavens, and, and I'll give you some homework if you haven't looked into that, is look up Genesis 1.14. And it describes God's purpose for the sun, moon, and stars. And it says it's for signs and seasons. The word for seasons in Hebrew is for the feast days or the set times, the appointed times. And uh, so when you stop and think about the chances of having an eclipse, period, you have one celestial body that's very large, crisscrossing with a smaller one at a much shorter distance, but they happen regularly every year. They happen in two-week sequences, and so the heavens are like this finely tuned clock. And so, uh, anyways, uh, that's what it's about, and, and it should be an interesting discussion, and you'll be surprised at what the scriptures say about uh, the subject of astronomy. Okay, thank you, Jim. All right, uh, our speaker this evening is Dr. Anthony Harper. He is the uh, editor of the Christian uh, News uh, Magazine, right? Intermountain News. Christian Intermountain News. Yeah, that's what it is, right? I'm, I'll get it right. Intermountain Christian News. And a Southern Baptist chaplain, ordained minister, with a doctorate in psychology from California Coast University. He also had his bachelor's from uh, liberal studies from the University of State of New York in Albany, and then his master's in general guidance and counseling from the College of Idaho, and a postmaster's graduate work with Liberty University. And so uh, his special interest has been in neuropsychology regarding traumatic brain injury, psychology of music, uh, he's the uh, second edition of the uh, 1998 issue of Who's Who in the Medicine and Healthcare, and is a uh, accomplished uh, musician and vocalist as well. Another one we had one last month, if you remember. <laughs> I got his uh, CD, by the way. It's great. Yeah, he sent it to me. Okay, Dr. Harper. Uh, he saw the need for a nonprofit hospital for the family of the young dangerously uh, 
you know, uh, going down the dark path of mental illness to depression and suicide. Uh, he knows, too, uh, to having been uh, one of those lost children, experienced clinical depression as a child. He didn't tell me that, but I see it here. Uh, he finally did his... Uh, get relief through the grace of God, of course, and the encouragement he found in the scriptures in 2 Timothy 1, uh, 1 chapter 2, and Psalm 40, 1 through 3, and he became the founder of the Children of Hope Family Hospital in Boise, Idaho. Uh, I think that is still under development, is that right? Yeah. Okay, his presentation this evening to us is Evolution and the Influence on Psychology. And uh, without further ado, let's give Dr. Harper a hand, please. It's great to be here, and uh, I have a lot to share in a short amount of time, but uh, we're going to have a, a movie after this presentation uh, titled A Matter of Faith, which I believe you'll really enjoy, and uh, I'll be taking orders for that movie uh, downstairs if you would like to get a copy of the movie ahead of time. I mean, we're, this is, these are pre-sales for orders for that, and uh, also uh, if you wanted to uh, be interested in subscribing to our Intermountain Christian newspaper. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boudreau was mentioning about the musician connection, and uh, I, I'm going to be singing a song for you. I actually started out in uh, at leading parts in college opera and music theater and traveled the nation as a soloist, as a tenor soloist. So... I uh, never thought I would be doing what I'm doing now, but uh, it's, it's a blessing to be able to do all those, all those things still. So, um, and uh, so we're going we're to have a, a gathering after this event tonight, and the movie's probably about an hour and a half or so, and my presentation is an abbreviated version in, in light of the, the movie tonight, but uh, I will look forward to uh, be able to expanding, uh, expounding upon that topic later. But... Uh, First, I want to be able to share a song that uh, really encapsulates the, the meaning of, of life about, you know, the gospel message and, and people needing the Lord. So. Every day
It's about Jesus. So to briefly summarize my testimony, as uh, Dr. Boudreau mentioned, I was one of those troubled kids. My parents were on the, on the verge of divorce, and at age 18, I was very depressed and uh, called a suicide hotline counselor, and that counselor turned out to be a drug dealer. And that's how I got involved with drugs, is through a suicide uh, hotline phone counselor. He said, meet me at a certain location and I can help you out, you know. And so it, was, it took several years to break free from that darkness, living in a drug dealer's home, uh, many dangerous situations, and feeling hopeless and helpless and, and didn't feel like I, I could accomplish much. And when you're on drugs a lot, your mind is wasted, you know, and uh, affected greatly. But I think of 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of a love and a power and a sound mind. Right? You know, uh, knowing Jesus makes you sound. The people that do not honor the Lord do not have a sound mind. I don't know where everyone is at here tonight, but only the Lord, God, the Creator, can make us stable. And I just love uh, the book of Hebrews where it refers to in chapter 1 about referring to Christ, the Son of God, that He sustains all things by His mighty word and power. So I just want Jesus to receive all the glory for what he's done in saving me from the depths of despair, uh, from those suicide times, and gave me great accomplishments, and I continue to be thankful for him. And I love to say in response when people say, how are you? And I like to say, I'm thankful, which leads to the next issue. They may ask why. And I say, because my, I, my sins have been forgiven. I've been forgiven. Jesus has forgiven me, and I have hope. So, one of the most missed opportunities in sharing the gospel is by giving a thankful response, which can lead to deeper responses as well. Opportunity for you to share. Well, I do have, um, and I want to, I know I can't cover very much here, but uh, my music website is anthonymusic.com, and uh, I have afterwards people that would want uh, those recordings for that. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see a lot more through my testimony on that website. But um, I have here, um, and I uh, hope you can appreciate the humor here. These are some psychology jokes 
And uh, one of them being, uh, I don't know if you saw, there was this uh, wild psychologist that was climbing a tree. And, uh, and uh, I don't know if you know that uh, in this case, uh, the response was, yes, I believe that was an evolutionary psychologist. He was up a tree with some bananas with no appeal. Sorry about that. So I'm going to punish you first off. That was uh, one that I had thought up, you know. Uh, would be, you know, fairly good here. But did you know the difference between a psychologist and a magician? Um, any answers for the difference between a psychologist and a, magi a magician? I don't see anyone raising their hands, so. So I'll go on to the, the, the answer is a magician pulls rabbits out of hats, whereas a psychologist pulls habits out of rats. <laughs> For those that are from a behavioristic, uh, behavioristic uh, perspective, you know. And we're going to get into that issue with uh, B.F. Skinner. There's a brief video clip of that. Um, also, a Freudian slip is when you say one thing and mean your mother. <laughs> Some of these might go over your head. But uh, anyway, what's the difference between a loan and a psychologist? I know they're not related, but anyone know the difference between a loan and a psychologist? Um, well, since there are, no, there are no answers, would be, the loan eventually matures and earns money. <laughs> so, although there are some psychologists that, that make a lot of money, right? But, uh, well, on another note, um, let me see here. I'm really getting, getting and rolling in the aisles here, so I better keep going while I have a... <laughs> Like some momentum here. What's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist? Well, if, if you say, I hate my mother, a, psych a, a psychiatrist will ask, why do, you, uh, why do you say that? And whereas a psychologist will say, thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> Just a little bit of difference, right? Uh, does the name Pavlov ring a bell? <laughs> for those that heard about Pavlov. And a psycho uh, here's a, for the Rocky Mountains, here's a joke, right? And these came from the Psychology Today website. A, psycho a psychotherapist returned from a conference in the Rocky Mountains where the delegates spent more time uh, on the icy ski slopes than they did attending lectures and seminars. Uh, when she got back, her husband asked her, so how did it go? And she said, fine, um, but, but I've never seen so many Freudians slip. <laughs> I love this one for the Rocky Mountain theme, you know? And, and to conclude here, um, there is a receptionist, says, a receptionist uh, to the psychologist in the office. Uh, Doctor, there's a patient here who thinks he's invisible. And the psychologist replies, tell him I can't see him right now. <laughs> So, a lot of people. Maybe that, I wanted to finish. Maybe the maybe the previous one was a little bit funnier to end on there. But uh, for those that need more appeal, um, you know, I suggest that uh, you know maybe you could go to the store and get a, a, a bunch of bananas or something. I don't know. But uh, we all we all need more appeal, right? And uh, so, um, you know, from that, kind of just re remember the funniest joke that you've heard tonight, and uh, we'll be doing a lot better. So, um, and I'm, I'm blessed for this opportunity to be able to, uh, to share this. Actually, this is my first time of speaking on the topic of evolution and its influence on psychology, but I've seen for a long time this, you know, the, the influence of evolution, impacting not only psychology, but medicine and education the whole mental health field and all that. And in our current newspaper that we have downstairs, is, there's an article by a psychiatrist, a friend of mine. It's on the topic of, uh, of homosexuality, which is uh, hot in the news today. And um, so I would en encourage you to get his, uh, to read that article. Um, and uh, they're very, uh, I don't meet too many people in the psychology area that uh, love the Lord. I know there are a lot of people there, but uh, uh, we are in the minority, I believe. And Jesus said, very few find the road to life, narrow is the way. So it implies for uh, most humans, sad to say, that would prefer um, a lie than the truth. And we're gonna talk about what, what lies are and what truth is, but uh, 
So for, um, you know, basically, you know, this word psychology being from uh, the, the Latin and uh, the Greek specifically regarding a, a personality uh, and matters of studying uh, the soul. And uh, so if psychology is the study of the soul, shouldn't people be experts in the understanding of the soul, which includes spiritual matters? Um, and I know a lot of people that might would uh, deny that we are spiritual beings, but uh, that that's one issue. That's a concern that I have. Is it ethical to claim to be an expert in something that you're not an expert in? So, and and there's no doubt that there are some for a lot of people that uh, the soul inclu includes some spiritual issues. It's not just the the physical brain and how the operation of that, but uh, the other component as well. Now, I guess for uh, people that from an evolutionary perspective, they wouldn't accept that there is a spiritual component. So I'm going to be getting into some more details here about that. Um, so on on to let me see here. On to the next uh, section about, the most importantly, is what does God's word say, right? God's word is the authority. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can understand it. But yet mankind thinks it is possible to know the heart or the soul and the mind without understanding its spiritual foundation. So I, I believe that the Bible is the word of God, literally true from beginning to end. And uh, I do believe in the literal six day creation. So um, I do believe what the Bible says is true. There's so much uh, information to back up the reliability of the Bible, it's overwhelming. People are without excuse, I believe. The evidence is all around us. And, you know, I like the topic of the, the conversation that you've, you've, you've heard probably many times before is the issue of information versus matter. Where does information come from? It's distinctive from matter. Matter cannot have form without information. So information implies intelligence. And uh, that's, I believe, God is the one that makes the most sense, the most rational conclusion of all. Uh, if information is has to exist prior to matter. Information just doesn't pop up out of nowhere. If you've seen the movie Expelled, No Room for Intelligence, a great movie, with Ben Stein, who I got to meet backstage. That was very humorous. He is a very dry humor person, much more drier than I am. So he didn't tell any psychology jokes, I don't think. But uh, on to the next one. This, this, this is a video, video clip. This next section is Richard Dawkins, uh, the famous atheist of the book The God Delusion, arguing some, with people about God. 40%, 45% of the American people believe literally in Adam and Eve, believe literally that the world is only 6,000 years old. I mean, that's a shocking figure, and you can't duck out of it by saying, oh, sophisticated theologians don't, don't believe it. Unfortunately, what sophisticated theologians believe isn't really relevant to what the majority of Christians do believe. I think, uh, Richard, Q. Chris from the Evangelical Alliance, if I may because you believe it's all true, don't you? I so, do, yeah. So you believe that, um, you know, Adam and Eve and, and, and Noah's Ark, you, you believe, to just take something, Genesis 19.5, two angels came to, to Lot's uh, house in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was the only uh, righteous man in the village, and uh, the locals wanted to, to know the angels, they wanted to homosexually rape the angels. So Lot offered his virgin daughters instead as an appeasement. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was, was demolished uh, after that and his wife um, turned into a block of salt when she looked back. I take you my, believe that happened? I take my cues from Jesus, who we've already agreed. So, uh, do you, did that accurate. happen? Uh, I believe that I Jesus believed the Old Testament to be historically accurate. Do you believe that that happened? I believe it happened because Jesus did. 
So what lesson are we supposed to get from that story? What, what moral lesson? Well, well, well there's somebody well, missing in the story. We'll come on to the moral lessons in a minute. Yeah. There's, there's somebody missing. But, but touch on it now, Richard. What's well, we were just told that, that what you get from the, from the Bible is moral lessons. And presumably, you say this didn't literally happen, but it's telling us something. What is it telling well, us? Well, the moral okay, so lesson let's is... let's listen to the voice the moral that's lesson missing is. in this story, which is Abraham. Yeah. Abraham turned to God yeah. and argued with God. Okay. So the message that I get from this story is argue about it, debate about it, don't accept it as true completely. Well, why is that? If you want to convey a message, which is in this case argue about it, why not just say argue about it? Why wrap it up? Do you want to remember that? that, that, that Richard Michael, 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 is this not, if I may ask you, you don't even know what the message is. That's how obscure it is. It's a moral message uh, from from the Bible. And of course, Richard, in your books, you've you've been pretty scathing about the God of the Old Testament. Um, Let me just quote you, if 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 I may. The most unpleasant character in all fiction misogynistic, homophobic, racist, genocidal, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, and you go on. It's, it's quite a list that you... I should have thought that was beyond dispute, but I, I would come on to the, to the New Testament. What about the God of the New Testament? Um, here we have a God who wanted to forgive mankind its sins, including, by the way, the sin of Adam, who he presumably knew perfectly well never existed. Nevertheless, he wanted to forgive mankind's sins. Why why didn't he just forgive them? Why was it necessary to have a human sacrifice, to have his son tortured and executed in order that the sins of mankind should be absolved? Is that not the most disgusting idea you ever heard? Okay. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen that video clip before, but in response to Richard Dawkins, uh, yes, there has to be a sacrifice. When, you're, when, when we know when we do good, there is always, there's a sacrifice in standing for truth. Jesus, st- Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He embodies truth. And as a result of that, it, God, God has given people free will to disobey, to accept, or to reject. And this is the only way God could have done it. Out of his love, he created. And so there is always a sacrifice for standing for good, for right. And Jesus could have uh, used his powers supernaturally to destroy the Romans, to destroy the whole world if he wanted to. But that would be in violation of his character. So Richard Dawkins doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand the concept of free will and of God's love. So the most likely that he's had some bad church experiences in the past, some bad religious experiences, and he's just angry with God. Uh, a lot of people uh, are angry with God uh, because they can't understand why bad things happen. Well, we understand the issue of free will. God could not have done it any other way. This is, this is the way it had to be out of his love. It makes more sense then. But there's a plan. God will bring justice, will punish evil. Everyone gets what they deserve in the end. We don't understand why it's taking so long at times, but I hope with you, Dr. Boudreaux, that the rapture soon. But that would mean that the impending judgment of God is going to be very intense very quickly, right? The tribulation time. But um, on to Charles Darwin, of course. The next uh, slide here about uh, Charles Darwin, who first proposed the theory of evolution by means of natural selection, born in 1809, died in 1882. But... um, Anyway, Darwin, I believe as well, had a lot of anger uh, towards God, a lot of misunderstanding about who Christ was. In earlier books, there was a denial of that issue, but in later revisions, uh, from page um, 87, from the autobiography of Charles Darwin, uh, with the original omissions restored, a statement here on page uh, on page 87 I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true for if so the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe and this would include my father brother and almost all my best friends will be everlasting everlastingly punished and this is a damnable doctrine so Charles Darwin could not imagine a just God. 
that would punish, that would destroy. We know from, from a family perspective, a bad parent is someone that, uh, a parent that would let their children do anything they want without any discipline. So I, I can see that a loving God, there's always discipline. And, and part of that discipline is separating the sheep and the goats. It happens in the book of Revelation where God, you know, separates the people that honor him from the ones that dishonor him. The ones that don't want him will get their dream come true. They'll be uh, completely separated from God forever. And they won't have to, uh, to deal with that. But, of course, that's their consequence. We all have consequences. So it, it, is, it is a matter of uh, consequences all of our actions. So now kind of, just uh, as I mentioned, you know, going through this uh, briefly, you know, there's a lot more information about uh, Darwin. And you, you're familiar with him already. But on to the, with a controversial person, uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud, um, born in 1856, died in 1939, uh, was here during the times of Hitler, but the father of psychoanalysis, uh, this is the, the next slide, Sigmund Freud is best known for his tendency to trace nearly all psychological problems back to sexual issues. And related to that issue, I'm wondering if he was sexually uh, confused or somebody had some bad experience in the past. But initially a Viennese medical doctor, Freud was trained in neurology and he originally drew inspiration from the work of Charles Darwin, which explained behavior in evolutionary terms. While Freud's theories have always been controversial, his work forms a major portion of the foundations of modern psychology with considerable, uh, considerable modifications by uh, later theorists. And uh, on to this next section here. Well, you know, basically what evolutionists and psychologists have in common, uh, in evolution, as with many secular psychologists, there is an acknowledgement, um, uh, there is no acknowledgement of a personal creator. Um, you know, the, the one argument is that, uh, I would say, and it's made in this movie coming up, is that Freud uh, believed the humans fabricated God because they did so in, out of fear of dying alone. But to counter that, I believe which is true, is that humans fabricated evolution out of fear of facing a holy God and being accountable for sin. Right? There's so much pride going on. People are in denial, and people prefer the lie than the truth. We've got great delusion that is going on. Churches are falling away from the faith, denying that the Bible is the Word of God. And when you throw out the Bible as being the foundation of the Word of God, then almost anything goes. You know, to me, in my mind, why, why, uh, why have, um, why have, uh, why, uh, you know, do anything good here on earth? If if this is all there is, then why not just get the most and do the most you want to do, since you won't uh, experience punishment afterwards in uh, hell or whatever? Of course, you know, Freud and others believe though that your punishment is just in the society that you're on you're in and you're doing this just just to uh, survive here and after this it's nothing but it's so illogical for me in my mind so that makes the makes the most sense of all the evidence is overwhelming to me that there is God but there you know there's a lot to think about with that issue and I foundationally believe that the Bible is the word of God from that that you know you should be able to, I think it should be able to be clear that uh, and even from all the evidence regarding the, the topic of information versus matter to believe that there has to be an intelligence a, a, a God and that we need a savior because we can't sure we, we surely can't save ourselves uh, humans haven't been able to do that yet right we see so much an attempt of uh, false messiahs uh, people that thought they were saviors but they never saved anyone from from anything from from the, the future at all but uh, on, there's a next video clip here that I want to show you here and it would be very nice if there was a God who created the world and was a benevolent providence, and if there was a moral order in the universe and an afterlife. But it is a very striking fact that all this is exactly as we are bound to wish it to be. The whole thing is patently infantile, so foreign to reality, that to anyone with a friendly attitude to humanity, it is painful to think that the great majority of mortals will never be able to rise above this view of life. In the long run, nothing can withstand reason and experience, and the contradiction religion offers to both is palpable. 
Okay, just a little bit. To... The idea of a god was not a lie, but a device of the unconscious, which needed to be decoded by psychology. A personal god was nothing more than an exalted father figure. Desire for such a deity sprang from infantile yearnings for a powerful, protective father, for justice and fairness, and for life to go on forever. God is simply a projection of these desires, feared and worshipped by human beings out of an abiding sense of helplessness. Religion belonged to the infancy of the human race. It has been a necessary stage in the transition from childhood to maturity. It has promoted ethical values which were essential to society. Now that a humanity has come of age, however, it should be left behind. Well, I'm going to... Uh in, in the interest of time, because we do have the, the movie coming up, there's, I want to contrast with the psychiatrist Carl Menninger had to say uh, regarding, he has a book called uh, Whatever Happened to Sin? So it's totally in contrast to Freud's book in The Future of an Illusion, where he's saying that humans fabricate a guide out of this fear of dying alone. And um, so, um, let me see here. So I don't know, how many of you heard of uh, Dr. Carl Manager? He's with the Manager Clinic for uh, a wellness psychiatrist. But I think that issue of sin uh, is makes a lot of people uncomfortable, maybe viewed as a dirty three-letter word. Very scary, you know, and, and now we have a lot of emotional issues happening. We have the, a lot of uh, the topic of homosexuality, and uh, we've got abortion issues. And uh, there has to be the issues of right and wrong, the moral issues have to be dealt with and uh, so a lot of people have been afraid to mention that word sin and I, I think out of our own uh, pride as humans it, it's hard to admit that we have sinned or done wrong but we need to be humble so I trust always more in people that are humble uh, about their mistakes and willing to confess that I really really love King David as an example of being repentant uh, emotional about what he had done wrong. He was crying out to God. He saw his helplessness. And so I, I look to him as a, as a good example in, in, in that sense, not about the other the problems that he had, but uh, in that response to sin, being broken and contrite, being humble before God. So... Um, I would uh, like, to, I guess, basically to, uh, you know, to sum all this up here in, and as I mentioned, Jeremiah 17, 9, uh, said the heart, heart is deceitfully wicked, uh, who can understand it? So psychology, apart from understanding our sin problem, cannot provide a solution to our human condition. And... Uh, we know God's love in John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God's love is, is here for us for, to experience uh, for anyone that would, would want to. And uh, so we can only enter heaven, as he says, from being born again. And that's just kind of a, a brief uh, summary, just the basic differences between um, secular philosophy and uh, philosophy based on God's word. And when, you, when you deal with the issue of sin, um, that, that is the basic, the, the basic problem here, is that not, uh, not acknowledging that it exists uh, has grave consequences. So, um, if anything, to remember, uh, I guess, of tonight's uh, presentation is that there's always consequences for what we do, but there is hope uh, through Jesus. Uh, that Jesus alone is the Savior uh, that can uh, give us uh, eternal life. So I'm, I'm assuming that everyone here knows the Lord, but those that don't uh, can know Jesus. And I would invite anyone here that doesn't know Jesus to uh, ask him to be your Savior from your sins before it's too late. Too, too late. The million dollar question is, if you died today, what would happen to you? Would you be, here, would you be in heaven or hell? Where would you be? And Jesus alone has the answer, the solution to that issue. We can, we can have the security knowing that we have a future. We have something to look forward to if we are humble and confess our sins 
Um, I think of Second Chronicles seven fourteen in light of what's going on with Israel. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. All of us need to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. And this, this uh, solution, I would say, is a good solution to terrorism that we're experiencing today. A lot of people are preoccupied with, with all the bad things that are going on, but only through that repentance is there uh, deliverance from terrorism. If we're humble before God and honor the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and accept Christ as our Savior, in the future there will be no more terrorism. So I'm, I'm excited about that promise. He will come back. Uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Boudreaux, hopefully very soon, right? You know, that uh, we will be caught away to be forever with the Lord and never a terrorist to deal with ever again. No fear. The king of the universe uh, will protect us. He is our great shepherd. So um, I just want to open up if you have any, uh, any questions here before we get into the movie. Uh, and uh, I think the movie will bring, uh, bring it all together from what I'm saying tonight in this brief presentation that uh, summarizes all these, these things. A very, uh, very good movie. And I just met the movie producer here about a week and a half ago in California. So um, hope you enjoy this movie coming up. But of course, I will be afterwards. I invite you all to come downstairs and, and uh, if you'd like to get a copy of the movie or uh, my music or or the you know to uh, anything else, it's there. And uh, so this is the movie, A Matter of Faith. Thank you.